So this is joint work with, between my group and the University of Padova. And I should say, oops, this, does this thing work? That, okay, it does. I should say that most of the work was done by the student, Luca. So I just want to give him credit before I start. And we're interested in looking at helpfulness of reviews and understanding the factors that distinguish a helpful review from one that is not helpful. And this is very important for many reasons. I mean, imagine if you want to advise people on how to write helpful reviews, it's important to know what it is that distinguishes a helpful review from one that's not. So when you think about, I mean, forget about reviews for a minute. Everybody is at this big conference, the web conference, very prestigious. When you read a paper, are you going to read the paper and assess it solely based on what's written in the paper? All right, I don't think so. At least one person was bold enough to shake their heads. Thank you. So none of us would read a paper and say, this is a good paper, solely based on what we read in the paper. And so uh, please keep that in mind as I go through the talk. So would you predict the helpfulness of reviews also by just reading the review and saying, this review is helpful or not? Or would you need to take a broader context into account? What are the factors that play a role in deciding if a review is helpful or not? And then there's this other question, what does it mean for a review to be helpful? Is that a concept that is fixed over time? Or does it change over time? Is what was helpful in 2010 going to be helpful today in 2024? And what about the vast amount of past work that's gone into this? People have looked at helpful reviews from the business world, from psychology, from computer science, other fields. So here's an example. And just to complicate the matter is the fact that platforms keep changing how they report whether a review is helpful or not. So for a long time, Amazon was reporting reviews and saying, you know, 46 out of 80 people found this review helpful. But more recently, they've changed that, oops, sorry, to say 157 people found this helpful, but without saying of how many, 157 out of 158 people or out of 2,000 people. So our question really is, when a new review is written by somebody, can we predict how helpful it is or not? And this is a paper that uh, was just published in um, ACM Transactions on the Web. And all the data and the code that's available is available publicly, all right? So uh, that's all been made publicly available. We looked at a vast amount of literature about this topic, and we found several issues. The first is because many different research communities were working on this problem, each with their own culture, each with their own traditions and practices, they often reported things in very, very different ways. Sometimes they would define a feature as one line in a paper. So reproducing that feature was almost impossible because we don't know exactly what it means. In other cases, they didn't make the data available, et cetera. And of course, they all use different definitions of helpfulness. We wanted to come up with a general framework that could be applied to different platforms, Amazon, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and so forth. And so we came up with this idea of a user reviews items graph, which is a multi-graph consisting of three different types of graphs internally. A graph on users, so for example, we may link two users together in this graph if, for example, those two users uh, wrote several reviews of the same product. So if user A and B wrote reviews of five common products, then you might draw an edge between them labeled with five. Uh, or alternatively, you might take a user and his behavior, derive a feature vector for that user, and say two review users are linked if their feature vectors are similar enough according to a definition of similarity. Likewise, you can do the same thing with reviews, same kind of graph on items. So again, these three graphs can be defined in many different ways. And of course, there's a natural multi-graph relationship because users write reviews. So there's an edge from a user to the review that that user wrote. And likewise, there's an edge from reviews to the item being reviewed, all right? So there are internal links in this graph, in this graph, in this graph as well as links across these graphs, causing it to be a multi-graph. So I want you to think back to the question I asked at the beginning. When you read a paper, do you decide 
on assessing the paper solely based on what's written on the paper. Astonishingly, most work we looked at in the literature, this big bar you see here, almost more than two-thirds of the work focused on looking solely at the review. Okay? And to us, that was astonishing. There were a few papers that looked at the product graph, the user graph, and the multi-graph nature of these reviews. What we wanted to do was to look at all three of them. Uh, I'm sorry, this picture here shows you a classification, a nice diagram, that captures the different kinds of graphs, the user graphs, the review graphs, and the kinds of features that different papers extracted from them. And in a sense, you know, uh, I like this figure a lot because it's a map of the entire space of work that's been done in this space. So I want to tell you what we found. And this was done by running experiments on six Amazon review data sets. By the way, these data sets were not data sets we collected. They were the Julian McCauley UC San Diego data set. Uh, and they have more than six. And, but we re-implemented a total of 905 uh, feature extractors. So across the literature, we identified a total of about 900 plus features, and we built extractors for them, all of which are available in the code base. And we trained 270 models in all across five basic models, six Amazon data sets, and nine categories of features. And these correspond to some of the bigger items in that hierarchical graph I showed you earlier. Uh, we defined helpfulness ratio to be the, positive, the number of positive votes on a review divided by the total number of votes on the review. That is the number of helpful votes divided by the total number of votes. Okay? And we said a review is helpful if the helpfulness ratio is over 75%. And by the way, you can play around with these numbers and the results don't change hugely. We separately compared what we got here with DNNs as well and three types, graph neural networks, distilbert, and MLPs. And let's take a look at a few things. The first is, by the way, we drew this kind of graph for many features. I'm just showing two in this paper, in this talk. You can see that there's a lot of drift. So here, for example, on the x-axis in both these is the number of quarters over time. So we took all the reviews in the data set and said, we're going to divide these into one quarter of a year, that is one three-month period another three-month period, another three-month period, and order them in order of time on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're going to look at the length of the review in terms of number of tokens. You can see here that as time went by, the number of tokens in reviews increased. That means that reviews tended to get longer over time. And you can see that increasing trend here. On the other hand, if you look at the star ratings over time, on average, they decreased over a period of about 60 quarters. OK? That's about five years. So that suggests that over time, the nature of reviews has changed even in just these two properties, and there are obviously many others. In addition, we looked at the question, are review-centric features the best at predicting things? And here, you see this uh, heat map where the columns correspond to different uh, classifiers. The rows correspond to using different features, and the colors and the numbers denote the F1 scores in predicting whether uh, a particular classifier predicts whether a review is helpful or not correctly, using just the features listed here. What you see here is that if you look at product history features, these F1 scores are significantly larger uh, for cell phones and accessories category compared to review readability or review structure, which are typically what I would think of as standard review-centered metrics. Uh, if you consider, on the other hand, all, so these numbers here are significantly higher than the two blue lines. And the same is true over here. The product history here is significantly higher than these two, suggesting that at least for these two categories, and we saw this across all the six categories in general, that review structure alone was not important enough compared to review structure and review readability. The intrinsic nature of a review was not enough to predict as well as using, say, the product history. Uh, by product history, I mean the history of reviews on the product, okay, over time. Um, this looks at the reviewer history, which looks at the nature of the review as a particular reviewer has written over time. 
And in the case of digital music, for example, reviewer history is more important than in cell phones and accessories. So again, what this suggests is what is important is not something that's a one-size-fits-all thing. In some domains, certain types of features are more important than other types of features. So again, when we look at helpfulness of reviews, it's not necessarily super smart to say just look at one set of features and this is important across the board uh, or, or reviews are imp impressive across the board. That doesn't mean the contact of, a content of a review should be ignored, by the way. We also looked at the question of cross-training. In other words, if I train on data about, uh, let's say, uh, digital music, how well does it predict on data about cell phones and accessories or toys and games or some other category? So what we saw across uh, five different uh, training, uh, sorry, six different training data sets and testing on the other data sets, so the diagonal entries in here are training on one data set and testing on the holdout set for that same data set, okay? So we did, you know, 70 train, 10 validation, and 20 test sets. You can see, not surprisingly, that the numbers along the diagonal are the best, but the numbers across the rows vary quite a lot. So for example, in the case of uh, training on electronics over here, uh, we can get good performance across several domains, but not all. Whereas in some other cases, it's like terrible performance here. For example, digital music. If you train on digital music and apply it on other settings, it often does very badly. How helpful is the helpfulness ratio itself? Well, this depends. Because it depends on a factor that we call credibility. So for example, a helpfulness ratio of 80% could mean, in the, for example, that there were five reviews in all of this product and four of them were help, helpful. I'm sorry, uh, there were five votes on this product, on this review, and four of them found the review to be helpful. That's 80%, right? But so is 100 votes and 80 of them are labeled as helpful. Most reasonable people would think that the latter is a more substantial and credible assertion of the 80%. So across all six categories, so we basically define three types of reviews. Reviews which had a low number of helpful votes, I rem don't remember exactly what intervals we used for that, a low number of helpful votes, a low number of votes, a medium number of votes, and a high number of votes. What you see here is that, and we call that the credibility, is it low, medium, or high? And what you see if you compare the first three bars for each of the six data sets is a steady increase. As there were more reviews, more votes on a particular review, our ability to predict whether that review is helpful or not went up, okay? So that suggests that this notion of credibility is really important and we obtain significantly higher F1 scores, about 5% higher if we go from low to medium, and if we go from low to high, it's on average as much as 13%. So that's in F1 score. Those are pretty big numbers if you think about it. Um, what about the use of deep neural networks? So we saw a lot of papers where people had proposed very, very complicated deep neural network architectures to predict helpfulness. They never compared with more classical machine learning algorithms like logistic regression, like decision trees, like SVM, and so forth. Um, that was interesting to us because when we tested against the three best classifiers in our earlier part of the work, against graph neural networks, Distilbert, and MLPs, we found something interesting. Um, across the six data sets with four numbers for each, low credibility, medium credibility, high credibility, and overall, we found that in those 24 entries, logistic regression gave us the best results in 14 of those 24, okay? Corresponding to these green highlights here. GNNs, uh, deep neural networks were not uh, useless, but if you look, GNNs gave us the best results in six cases. Uh, the Stilbert in four and MLPs in two. So these were still useful, still competitive, but not 
performing uniformly anywhere near as well as logistic regression. And what this told us, especially with the Stilbert, which is largely language-based, based on the content of the review, is that even though logistic regression suggests that we can do really well uh, across all categories, uh, the language is still important. So language is still important, but as shown in my previous slides, the other factors tend to be also very, very important. So ignoring one or the other is a bad idea. So I'm going to sort of wrap up. I don't know how much time I've got left, but I suspect I'm close to the end. And so I'm just going to wrap up and say the, unif the user review items methodology is captures both the language of a review as well as the relationships between the users writing those reviews, as well as the relationships between the reviews themselves, such as similarity between reviews, as well as the similarity or relationships between the products involved. So the nature of that graph is quite useful in making these predictions. And in general, as I showed, gives us, when we go from low to medium to high, between 5 and 13% improvement in F1 score. Uh, we also have uh, concluded that these predictive models um, exhibit concept drift. And what was a good model uh, five years back may no longer be a good model today for two reasons. One, the way people write reviews today. And two, the fact that the way platforms are reporting what has been stated to be helpful and what is not has also changed. And uh, well, I can, and this is, when I talk about issues with the definition of the ground truth, I mean the notion of credibility, OK? Have there been at least a certain number of reports of helpfulness about a given re review? Have there been a certain number of votes cast about the review, which allows us to get enough ground truth about that review? So uh, again, our data and code. Uh, can be uh, obtained for uh, the data you can get also from uh, the Macaulay website at UC San Diego. But all our code for extracting features, the models, the training, et cetera, are available from here, including the GNNs, the Distilbert, and the uh, uh, MLP code. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.